Good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Heart. Thank you for joining us this morning. I think all of the band happened to be traveling the same week, so you're stuck with me this morning. <laughs> uh, before we begin, I want to read just a, a line from the last psalm in the psalm book. Um, and I want to read it maybe three times. And I want to, to take a breath. Um, so... Psalm 150, verse 6, says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And what I want you to do right now is just imagine all the things that are breathing. Maybe in this room, the things that are breathing outside. The cool part about singing praise music is even though, like I said, the band is, is all... Uh, Seems to be traveling on the same day. Hopefully they're not going on tour without me or something. But that we're joining a song that creation is singing already. So let me read this again. Think about everything that has breath. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And this last reading, I want you to close your eyes and breathe a deep breath in. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Would you stand with me?
never gonna let me down You're never gonna Never gonna let me down You're never gonna Never gonna let me down You're never gonna Never gonna let me
join in the song creation is singing praising you you are good you are holy and you love us in our belovedness lord may we approach you this morning to be shaped to encounter your spirit to see christ to honor the father may our lives may our hearts may the meditations of our hearts May what is said here, may our study this morning, our teaching, our praise, our service, may it all exalt you. You, God, who are loving and kind, abounding in steadfast love. May your reputation increase here among us and in the world. In your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody, may be seated. Kids, I'll meet you up front. I've got props. <laughs> Hello, children. I have... I have something that you can I have some things that you can touch and things that you can't because there's some danger in what I'm about to show you. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't think you want to sit there. You'll see. You'll see. Hold on. Okay. I have Hold on. I got a, a few things, but I've got this box of dirt. Was kind of a box. Is this a box? It's a round box something. It's a tray. A tray of dirt? We'll call it a tray of dirt. So this, this is my, my uh, parable terrarium. I, I don't know. You'll see. Okay. Jesus told a story. Um, you guys want to? I guess. 
Anybody like okra? I'll just pick these out. Okra seeds. I didn't know the seeds looked like that. Here, grab, grab one. Yeah, you'll get one, Jack. Here, I'm going to go around and pass one to everybody. Take a seed. Don't put it up your nose. Yeah. Yeah, you do? Oh. Okay, take a seed, take a seed. We're going to, oh, did you eat it? There, the, an okra will grow in your stomach if you do that. That's not true. Everybody's got a seed. So we're going to do a, a, a live demonstration of the parable of the sower, in case you haven't already figured that out. Oh, you dropped it? I'll get you another one. That's all right. Maybe it'll grow here in the auditorium. Who knows? We'll have some high school okra. There's probably <laughs> worse things growing <laughs> in the high school. Okay. All right. What is that? What are you holding in your hand, guys? A seed. Hold it up. Look at it. Look at it. Now, Jesus told a parable, a story. You guys know what a parable is? Hey, Rowan, Jack. Hey, guys. I know you're having so much fun. You're going to have a lot of fun in the gym in just a minute. But for now, let's pay attention. What do you, what do you hold in your hand? Say, say it loud. A seed. Jesus told a parable and talked about the kingdom of God being like this seed. But that wasn't the end of the parable. He said it was like a, like a sower. You guys know what a sower is. You sow your seed. So um, you guys can um, stand up, and uh, you can uh, toss your seed from this height into the terrarium. So take turns, one at a time. Uh, we'll start with August, August, go, and we'll go down. Go ahead. Yep, just drop it somewhere. Drop it somewhere. Drop it somewhere. Drop your seed somewhere in here. Those are kind of hard to see. I should have picked, like, a brighter seed. I'm going to. All right. Anywhere? Anywhere? Yep, yep. Anybody? Interesting. Anybody else? You got one? You got one? You lost yours. Here. Have a seed, sir. Anna, you want a seed? You want to sow a seed, guys? No? You could just take it if you want. Yeah? Okay. You want a seed? No? Okay. That's fine. All right. Now, kids, you're kind of, you, you've, <laughs> they've all sowed in the good soil. Spoiler alert. So I'm just going to do that. Does anybody make, make anybody nervous here? I'm just throwing the seeds everywhere. If you were farming a really big piece of land, you'd probably have to throw seed. And that's what they used to do. The sower would throw some seed. Now, some of that seed would land. What is this, guys? This is, this is a path. Is that seed? You guys see that seed right there on that rock? Is that going to grow? Everybody have a seed. Have a seed. You can see it. You can see it. It's one of the rock. It's not, it's not going to grow, August. Why not? It doesn't have any dirt. Oh, dirt is important. Okay. Uh, what about seed right underneath this actual thorn? Th does anybody know what this is? I thought it was stinging nettle. Is that? I got poked the other day. It's not. Thistle? Burdock? I don't know. It, it's something pokey. Uh, I, I thought if I told you guys that there were thorns in this thing and it didn't have thorns, you'd be like, that's not thorns. So I, I actually harvested thorns to my detriment. Um, so, but guys, let's say this seed right here. You see it? We'll say it grows. And that Jesus' parable, he said that uh, that seed might get choked out by the thorn. Right? So it needs space, doesn't it? And if it was right on, on top of another uh, plant... Uh, that was aggressive, uh, that, that seed might not make it. So it might, it might come up a little bit, and then it get choked out, okay? And then there's other seeds over here. You guys threw right here in the soil, but, but just beneath that soil, there's actually a bunch of rocks. So if you, if you threw that, that seed there on the thin soil with rocks in it, it might grow, but it might not have enough room to get all the way down to the good soil underneath. So what's the moral of this story, guys? Jesus says the that this is what the kingdom of God is like. It's like that seed. Imagine this. You guys hear a lot about Jesus, right? Raise your hand if you've heard about Jesus ever before. You hear a lot. Every, every time you hear about Jesus, it's kind of like this, guys. It's kind of like this, okay? Throwing seeds. And, and Jesus said that some people are like this stone, and some people are like this rock, and some people are like the space underneath this thistle, and some people are like the good soil, where does it land? If, it, if, it, if the word of God, the good news about Jesus lands deep in your heart, guess what? Like right there in that good soil, what's going to happen? 
What's going to happen? Seed's going to grow. It's going to produce fruit. It's going to grow more seeds. Isn't that kind of awesome? But sometimes, maybe we're not paying attention, and the Word of God just kind of bounces off us like that, hitting the path. Oh, I forgot. Hold on. I have another prop. If it landed on the path, sometimes... Oh, gosh. It's not working. I'm sorry. Bird. And it picks the, the seed, and the seed's gone. I don't know if that kind of bird actually... Well, I know it doesn't live around here. I don't know if it eats okra seeds or not, but there's, one, there's, there's something about this parable, parable, guys, that I wanted you to see because you are not stuck being this kind of soil. You're not stuck being this kind of soil, thin, and you're not stuck here. There's this thing that farmers knew about when they heard this parable. It's called farming. Okay? And you can take the thorns out of your life, and you can dig the rocks out of your heart, not literal rocks, you guys know what I'm saying, the hard places in your heart, and you can take them out, and I believe we, by being better listeners about God's word, can prepare the soil of our hearts, you follow me on this metaphor, so that God's word can accomplish what it sets out to accomplish. There's this wonderful verse in Isaiah that talks about the, the word of God doing what he said it was going to do. And you know how much God loves you? And do you know how many good things he says about you and how he wants you to come to know him through Jesus? I believe if we just let the soil of our hearts soften just a bit, we do a little bit of work trying to listen, trying to pay attention, trying to really think about what God is saying. I think that seed is going to grow, and that seed is going to turn into a plant, and that plant is going to give more seeds. So, guys, I just want this to, what did I take out of the thorn? So it, couldn't, so it couldn't crush the other plants from growing. It's very sharp. No, I, I don't, I want to spare you that. Don't step on this, Graham or Michael. Just, it's actually sharp. It hurt. Okay. Let me, I'll quit (laughs) ad-libbing here. Guys, the word of God is like this. So if you do a little gardening of your heart, so to speak, be a little less listener. If you you want to be the good soil, sometimes it takes a little bit of work. I know I have a hard time paying attention sometimes. And I have to remove things in my life that don't belong. But the more I garden my heart, God's word does something beautiful. So guys, keep that in mind. Um, all right, let's pray, and you guys will be joining Kelly and Sarah. Oh, there's Kelly uh, in the gym, and you guys will have a fun time. All right, you guys ready? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for for Jesus and the way that He was able to teach an amazing idea with a simple picture, and it and it just resonate with us and help us understand who you are and what you want to do in our lives. God, would you help our this help us to garden the soil of our hearts that we might be good soil, that would be a a soft place, a deep place for your word to land, for it to take root, for it to grow, and it to produce fruit in our lives. God, as these kids over and over every week, every day, their parents, their church family, uh, your uh, your own stirrings in their heart, God, there's so many seeds here, and we just pray, Lord, that as we encounter you, that that, um, over and over again, God, that these seeds would, would, would grow. May, uh, may your word dwell richly in our hearts as we continue to make ourselves uh, a soft space for your heart to land. So God, would you, would you, uh, yeah, would you remove the things in, in, our, in the way of our hearts and let your word dwell richly among us. And may the kids have fun today. <laughs> Amen. All right. You guys have fun. They're gone.
Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Ethan, for pulling double duty this morning. We appreciate you in lots of different ways. I am going to hang down here. I'm not worried about your thorns, but I was thinking about doing that anyway. I'm going to push these aside. There we go. Good morning, again. It's great to be with you all this morning. My name is Graham. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at The Heart. We're grateful to see you all. Special welcome to you. If you're with us for the first time, I got to meet some people who are with us for the first time this morning, and we're always really grateful for that. I have a few different updates and announcements for us this morning, as I always do. There's a lot going on in the month of August. It tends to be kind of a kickoff month for us. So I wanted just to remind you of some things and tell you about some new things before Mike comes to teach today. The first thing I want to mention is that, as you know, we recently hired a new worship director, Jasmine. We are super, super grateful to God for the provision of Jasmine. I think she's going to be a great addition to our team, Jasmine Shaw. She is moving up the mountain from Wilmington. So her first day, or first official day on staff will be August 8th. Her first Sunday leading worship here with us at the heart will be August 14th. But she is moving to town on August 6th, that is the Saturday, and she'll be leaving Wilmington and making her way up here, so actually moving into her new place in the afternoon kind of time of August 6th. So number one, wanted to mention that again, just so that you can keep Jasmine in prayer as she makes that transition and, and as she joins staff here at the heart, but also if anyone happens to have any availability on Saturday, August 6th in the afternoon. I'm sure Jasmine would appreciate some extra help. Some of us on staff will try to make sure that we're there helping her as well. But if anyone wants to be a part of that, it's a chance to meet Jasmine and a chance to serve her on the 6th. So let us know if that's something you're interested in at all and definitely do keep Jasmine in prayer. Also, just a reminder that our youth group is going to start up again this week. They took a bit of a break for the month of July, but youth group will start again this coming Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. That's in the Three Forks Association building just there on 194. So if you are anywhere between a rising 6th grader to 12th grade, you're welcome to participate in that in our youth group. Ethan helps to oversee that, and it is a great group of kids. I had a chance to be with them a couple of weeks ago, and I'm not saying that they're the most fun part of the heart, but I'm not not saying that either. We had a great time together. Uh, So let us know. Reach out to Ethan in particular if you have any questions about youth group or joining youth group, but really any member of staff would be happy to talk to you about that and mark it for uh, their startup again this week. Okay, what else? A couple more things. Just a reminder again that we are going to have a volunteer appreciation event following the service next Sunday, so a week from today, just a simple gathering in the media center, which is just around the corner from the lobby. So again, just immediately following the service, we're going to gather together there. If you volunteer in any capacity here at the heart, you are welcome to participate in that with us. We'll have some light refreshments. The ministry leadership team will be with us there in that space. It's mostly just a chance to say thank you to all of our volunteers and people who give so sacrificially of their time and talents. It'll also be a chance for us to just share some information about where we're headed over the next six months as a church family. So if you are able to be a part of that next week, we'd love to have you. Okay, last thing before Mike comes up, we have our next table talk gathering scheduled for August 31st. So pretty much exactly a month from today. It's a Wednesday evening. It will be at Valley Cruces Conference Center again for those who want to join together in person. We'll have an online option available as well. But this is our next Table Talk event. Again, these are just a chance to enter into some conversations together as a church family about some different things that are facing the church and facing our culture right now. And to do that together, even where there are differing perspectives or different backgrounds or whatever it might be, we believe that we can come together with Christ right at the center and have those conversations with one another. So this next one is called Church in Power, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Otherwise, I'd be up here for 20 more minutes probably. Um, But check out the website for more information about this next Table Talk 
talk at theheart.us. That's where the spiritual practice and study session for this next table talk will be posted as well. And mark your calendars for the 31st. The registration link is live and that'll go out over the course of the next couple of weeks on the email and some other places as well. So look out for that too. And then plan to join with us on the 31st of August. Alrighty. Michael, over to you, sir. I feel like I missed the black memo this morning. You and Ethan are looking pretty sharp in your black, but we'll work to coordinate next time. Over to you. The cool club wears black. That's right. <laughs> it was never me either, but I keep trying to start it, and I'm the only member. We're going to be in Acts 15 today. Have you ever um, experienced uh, kind of like a, a prerequisite before you could fit in? It's, it's, it's actually fitting that we're talking about this kind of club mentality, right? Even though it's a joke. Where like in order to, to really be on the inside track, you have to, to agree to a certain set of of seemingly arbitrary rules. When I first got into ministry, I was at a church in Anchorage, Alaska, just kind of a volunteer on the youth staff and um, really enjoyed it. And I got an opportunity through the, through the, the mentoring of, of the senior pastor there to, to learn how to do expository preaching. It's actually the, the seeds that were sown for 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 me standing here. And I remember some of the very first conversations I had with, with my mentor, uh, Darius, who was teaching me how to read God's word and then communicate it to people about nothing that had to do with God's word. It actually had to do with whether or not I should be allowed to preach in a t-shirt. Because they should... They, right, this is always kind of an introduction into your heart when you start talking about they and we and, right? So they weren't spiritual enough to just see past my t-shirt and to the great things that I wanted to give them in the Lord's name. Does anyone here see any issue with that stance at all? No one? Okay, you can, come on. You can throw tomatoes if you want. That's, that was my heart. I should be allowed to, and when I'm not, they need to grow up. And I say this because here is the advice that I was given. Michael, someday you will be able to wear a t-shirt and preach to our people. But right now, that t-shirt is an obstacle to them seeing the heart of God. And guess what? You do not want to be an obstacle to people seeing God. Does it hurt you to wear a button-up shirt so that people can see the heart of God? And if it doesn't hurt you, why wouldn't you remove that distraction for them? I didn't have an answer. I didn't like it. But the point that Darius was trying to help me to understand in that moment as a young, very young man was it's not my job to force people to be comfortable with me. It's my job to remove all unnecessary distractions so that they can see God. And when somebody can see the heart of God, eventually they trust your heart as well. And the t-shirt becomes a moot point. And guess what? A couple of months later, Somebody from the church who was adamantly opposed to t-shirts on the stage said, I really miss your t-shirts and your spiky hair. 
And that was permission. And I got to preach in a t-shirt and no one made an issue of it. It was silly. It's, it's, it's actually, it feels dumb to even tell the story because the, the reality is, 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 as silly as that is, we tend to assume that our preferences and our values, wherever they come from, however good or righteous they might be, are what others should be doing too. And in Acts 15, we actually encounter this. This is kind of the apex or the the crux of the book, the the, the turning point where where Luke, the writer, is is writing to Theophilus and and he really starts to, to, to hone in on the fact that the gospel is for you, Theophilus, a Gentile, a Greek, So I want to read through verse 21. That's where we're going to stop today. We're going to stop in the tension point of this and just sit in it for a week. And that's on purpose. Because sometimes we need to do that. But let's read all the way, all 21 verses, and then I want to just kind of explain what is going on here. And then let's talk about what this might look like in today's world. But some men came down from Judea, And we're teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and to the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles. And brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the pardoncy of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter, and after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, and James is the the leader of the Jerusalem church, the the half-brother of Jesus. James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon, which is Simon, which is Peter, (laughs) has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name, And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return, and I will build the tent of I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known of old. Therefore, my judgment is is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who run or who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality and from th- what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Now what happens is... Barnabas and Paul have returned from their first missionary journey in the region of Galatia. 
They're at their home base church of Antioch. And while they're there, a group of, of believers come from Judea who want to make sure that any Gentiles who come to, to faith in Jesus also become ceremonial, ceremonial Jews. And Barnabas and Paul are saying, no. They stand up immediately and they say, no, this cannot be. It's not Jesus and, it's Jesus. And they can't solve it. They can't figure out an agreement And so the the leaders of the church decide to send Paul and Barnabas and and a few others to Jerusalem to specifically ask the, 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 the apostles and the elders of that church to help them to come to a conclusion. And I want to say that the the assumption here is that whatever whatever side you're on, the decision that the Jerusalem church makes is the one that we're going to live with. That's the idea. So it's not like, I don't think there is a, there's an ulterior motive to try and convince the Jerusalem church to take one side or the other. It is to present, this is what God has done, and are there any additional requirements for somebody who has placed their faith in Jesus who is not Jewish by birth? And so Paul and Barnabas and their companions, they go down. And on their way, they actually share the story of what God has done on their journey to to the churches that that Peter and Philip had planted in Phoenicia and in Samaria on their way to Jerusalem. And it brought the fruit of the Spirit, joy, to the churches there. Notice there's no mention of any sort of dissension here. And these are These are churches that are predominantly Jewish. It's important to know. And they get to Jerusalem and they're welcomed. Oh, you're back. Tell us what happened. And they say, God has worked miraculously. We have seen him save people who we thought were outside of the bounds. And in telling the story, brothers who are also Pharisees, this is important. We hear the word Pharisee and immediately we go to like, of course it's the Pharisees. But let's let's take a step back. The Pharisees believe that in maintaining the purity of the law, they will be saved. And yes, there's there's some there's some some issues with that, right, when you've come to Jesus. But it's also important to know that if you were born and raised Jewish, that your cultural, your ethnic identity is completely woven together with your religious identity. They are very difficult to separate. And so I think we need to have a bit of compassion for these brothers because I think what they are doing is saying, yes, but what about all of our faithfulness? Are are we to just ignore that? Are we to now become Gentiles? And this is a problem for them. It's a deep problem that that, that strikes at the core of their values. So I think we should understand why they're asking this question and not throw rocks. (laughs) Because I think they really want to know, how big is Jesus? And where do we fit in this? Have you ever wondered that? How big is Jesus and where do I fit in this?
And so the debate really fires up. No small debate, the text says. They really, really wrestled together with this. I think things probably got heated. Because what happens when you feel like your identity is being attacked? You get heated. You get heated. And, and, and for everybody involved, all of whom who are Jewish, they're wrestling with who are we in Christ? And does how he and this gospel define us wash away what else has defined us? Or does, does it somehow coexist? And do we have to force this on someone else who did not grow up this way? Or can the, the world and the culture and the... And the, the, the the, the racial identity that, 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 that those people have, can, can, can Christ exist there in faithfulness too? It's a good question. And so they debate. And they're getting nowhere. They're getting nowhere. And that's when Peter is able to just bring everyone to silence. And he speaks. And he says, God has already saved Gentiles through my mouth. And he bore witness to himself by bringing them, by giving them, by imparting the same Holy Spirit that we got. And God himself made no distinction. He didn't say, here's the Holy Spirit, and this is what you need to do to keep it. He just said, grace. My grace is sufficient. And now that everybody is silenced and, and kind of had this moment of clarity, oh yeah, God is doing that among us. Now Paul and Barnabas are able to share in further detail what they had witnessed and that God bore witness of himself there too. And then James. Speaks that the prophets have also laid the groundwork for this. And he speaks from Amos as an example. And he talks about how in Amos, when God is going to, to bring Israel back into its eternal and full glory that uh, Israel is actually redefined as including all the nations. It says the nations. He's talking about Israel, rebuilding Israel's tent, and then it says, and who God has called from the nations to be a part of this will be blessed too. It's beautiful. And because not only the, the witness of, of Peter and of Barnabas and of, and of Paul, but the witness of their own scriptures, he says, I'm ready to make a decision. I'm ready to make a judgment and tell you what it is. And he says, no, I don't think it is right. It is wrong, in fact, 
to, 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 to make Gentile believers in Jesus become ceremonial Jews. It doesn't actually accomplish anything. It doesn't accomplish anything. You can be a Christ follower and a Jew. You can be a Christ follower and a Gentile. And in this world, that's everybody. And we do not have to adopt the same way of being to be included. And there's a but. There's a but. And this was really, really consuming for me this week, was trying to figure out what this but means. Because it is not a free-for-all. It's not a free-for-all. It's not you do you to the fullest extent of, of that idea. And what James prescribes is don't eat meat sacrificed to idols or spoiled by idols. That's connected to worship. Sexual immorality, also connected to worship in the Gentile world. Or eat animals that have been strangled and, and with the blood still in them. Also related to worship. And I found myself realizing that, that there, is, there are cultural realities that have to be held up to the person of Christ and deemed that these are actually a focus in the wrong direction. So we shouldn't do them. Because Jesus is the final sacrifice. Our table is his body and his blood. Not the table of pagan sacrifice. Our fulfillment comes from the person of Christ and not from sexual immorality. And, and the, the way that, that sexual immorality was, was lived out in, in, in pagan worship was as a means of inciting the gods to appease the gods to do something, typically in relation to, to crops. We do this, and we kind of show God what he's supposed to do, and then our, our city, our, our location is fruitful. But under the, the, this idea of who Jesus is and what the gospel does is the fact that God is the one who creates and sustains. He's the one that brings feast and famine. He alone is to be worshipped. And he does not need to be appeased. He has been satisfied in the completed work of his son. So these things that are related to this idea of worship that says we lack. The paradigm is now shifted to we are fulfilled. So don't go there. But there's this statement at the end about for, for generations Moses has been proclaimed and read in all of these Gentile places. I didn't know what to make of that. I was stuck there. It's, it feels so cryptic. I'm, I'm so far removed 
from, from this, this culture and this idea that all they can do is guess. And so my guess is these are also things related to how to relate as Jews and Gentiles under the banner of Christ. It's not just about worship. It's also about how to love another culture. Because all of those things are detestable to Jews. So, yes, the Jews are being asked, love the Gentiles in this. Do not force a yoke on them that Christ does not intend for them to bear. And Gentiles, live your life in a way that demonstrates that you understand because you have heard, because Moses has been declared to you for generations, that you understand that in living your life in, in, in a way that is contrary to an idea and a concept of purity and singular worship to God, is going to cause a relational problem with your Jewish brothers and sisters. Love them. They're both being called to love without sacrificing their identity because they have a bigger and broader identity in Christ. It's beautiful. And we end up seeing this played out in Paul's letters especially to the first Corinthians. Not to the first Corinthians. In his first letter to the Corinthians. Where you have this, these, these, these rifts, these tears, these chasms in the church, these divisions over freedom and law. And Paul is saying, can you, on the freedom camp, learn some restraint from the law camp for their benefit, for your benefit, for the name and glory of Christ? Yes, you can. You who are in the law camp, can't you learn something from the freedom camp? And can't together you have a more robust expression of faith because of your diversity? And then he goes on to, in chapter 12 to talk about this, this beautiful diversity of gifts even though we have one spirit. And that when those things work together and not against each other, we have a beautiful and dynamic living reality pursued from love. I know if I say the word diversity, we get a lot of different definitions. It is what it is. It's words these days. When I talk about diversity, I'm talking about the fact that it's not a free-for-all. You don't just get to be anything all the time. It's actually understanding not who you are, but valuing who someone else is. And seeing how God wants to use that in the life of the church for his glory. And so sometimes that means not wearing a t-shirt to preach. Sometimes it means that we have to, to, to remind ourselves in our world, God and Christians are not anti liberalism, but they're not liberals. We're not anti conservatism, but we're not conservatives. We're not anti fill in the blank 
What we are is a, is a diverse group of people who come from all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of understandings, all kinds of, of cultural realities. And it is Christ that unites us, not our cultural realities. And those things can coexist. But sometimes we have to stop. We have to say, am I leaning on who Christ is here or am I leaning on what I want someone else to be? Graham and I and Ethan have had this conversation of how do you hold out hope for someone without having an agenda for them? I think we see the, the groundwork being laid here. It's okay to wrestle with questions and say, okay, God, but if, if, if this isn't the requirement, what is? And then to lean hard into Christ. Because we need his help. We need his help. And what Luke wants Theophilus to know is that Christ is the apex. And what I believe we need to know is that Christ is the apex. And there are so many things that we entangle ourselves in, so many echo chambers that we walk into, that we hang out in. And Christ is not a part of the conversation. We have to bring him with us. We have to be mindful of who he is and what he has made us all to be and that we are in process. And wrestling with questions of right and wrong and what must be and what must not be are part of life. But they should not turn into anger and hate. They should turn us to Jesus. It's a weird tension we live in as believers. Wanting so badly to be in the, the final and re fully realized kingdom of God and realizing that we're not. It is finished, but it doesn't feel like we're done. And that's the tension that we live in. That's the heart behind verses like be in the world but not of the world. That we're foreigners in this place. That this world is not our home. But it doesn't mean we ignore it. We have James's judgment on the matter. We don't have the final resolution. We're going to encounter that next week. But this week, I think it's important for us to sit in the tension and ask ourselves on a personal level, what are my deal breakers? What are those things that, 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 that might actually be unnecessary and burdensome obstacles for the gospel to take root in someone's life? Or what are those things that when someone has placed their faith in Jesus, I think, okay, now you need to, now you need to, now you need to. Are they from Jesus or not? That's the question. Are they from Jesus or not? Let's pray. Father, it 
it's interesting that we want so badly to uh, We want a discipleship where people look a lot like us and not a lot like you. And I pray that you would help us, Father, to reject that from our lives, from our thinking. Not to the point of of declaring that that who you have made us to be is bad. (laughs) No. No. It's actually the fact that that we need we need a variety of of, of people and experiences and, and cultural realities to help to help us to realize what the kingdom of God really looks like and how beautiful it is. Help us. Help us to know what those those unnecessary barriers are in our lives. And Father, I pray that you would dismantle them. And I pray that something beautiful would emerge. In your name, amen. Would you stand with me?
this earth His saving power